Hello, Step Back friends and allies. Welcome to another Quick Step. Uh, again, delayed because I am still working out the unending chaos that is my life these days. So I was actually a little bit at a loss what to talk about. I feel like the news has been dominated by all the discussion about Michael Cohen and the Trump Russia stuff and all the investigations that are going down there. But despite all that's happened, I still feel like the other shoe is yet to drop on that. And I don't really want to talk about it unless I have like a more complete story because it's a very big and very Byzantine subject that is going to require uh, a little bit extra research than the average quick step video. So I polled some of my friends, my creator friends, about what I should talk about. And I got a good recommendation from American Johnson, who runs the channel Non-Compete, someone you should subscribe to. But yeah, he suggested that I talk about what happened with a missionary named John Allen Chow, who went to North Sentinel Island and was killed by its indigenous inhabitants. Not only that, but India, who has authority over the island, is not going to press charges, and they gave up on the process of even trying to recover his body. Now, the only things that Americans said he could find online were basically like atheist skeptics who were mocking this poor guy for dying and people talking about how evil and savage the people on the island are. I think this is one of those things that doesn't really have a good or bad take. It's just something that needs to be unpacked and thought about. Mistakes were made. Mistakes were made by John Allen Chow, but no one deserves to die for these things. But hey, let's 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 break it up. So the Sentinelese people who live on North Sentinel Island are a fairly isolated tribe of indigenous people. They live completely isolated existences in a area that is rather small and probably only have a population of about 50 to 100 people. Some estimates go between 15 and 500, but most say between 50 and 100, maybe 200 at the most. It's hard to do censuses on these people because they basically attack anybody who comes to the island. You've probably heard about these people in like a top 10 facts thing, but uh, because there's a little bit of an interesting story with the whole attacking people thing. But honestly, that kind of stigmatizes them in a way that I don't think is fair. But what is interesting is they attack everybody who comes to the island, including like helicopters. Like they will actually like shoot bows and arrows at helicopters. They've also been there for a fairly long time. The first historical recording that came up about them is in 1771, where the British found the island, or at least saw that there was life and activity on the North Sentinel Island. The next time that they were seen was in 1867, where a British merchant ship by the name of Nineveh landed on the shores of North Sentinel Island and were promptly attacked by indigenous people. A few people survived this encounter and the crew were able to fend off the Sentinelese people until they could be rescued a little bit later. The next instance of meeting with these people came from a British colonial officer who visited the island, made some observations, said that they were simple hunter-gatherers who mostly ate fish. In 1897, a British penal colony prisoner tried to escape to North Sentinel Island, and a few days later, he was found killed, looked like his body had been riddled with arrows and his throat was slashed. And it was in the late 19th century when they really established that, yeah, these are a group of people who are extremely hostile and basically attack anybody who visits their island. Something that has stayed true all the way to today. Now, after India got independence, the North Sentinel Island became part of the Indian administration. And starting in 1967, going to 1991, a anthropologist by the name of Dr. Pandit tried to study the North Sentinelese people and get an idea of what their culture was like, starting with just sort of observing off of his ship using binoculars. The anthropologist decided not to interfere. They left a few gifts and then um, made their way back. The Indian government also started to take this very seriously because they knew that if they did no action to protect the Sentinelese people, that in the Indian Ocean, where there's a lot of piracy and uh, unscrupulous people at sea, that they would probably end up being wiped out or they would end up being exploited horribly by you know, the literal slave trade and things like that. So the Indian government has put an intense uh, protection notice on the island. It's actually now illegal to travel there, and they actually have a naval appointment that fires on people who try to get too close. It also doesn't help that the language of the Sentinelese people is 
unintelligible with any other language. So without study, we wouldn't be able to speak with them. So basically communication is impossible. And then 1974, National Geographic made a documentary called Man in Search of Man and went to the island to see what kind of information it could get. And they actually went with Dr. Pandit, so they had at least some authority with them. When the ship got through the barrier reef that protects the island, very soon after the Sentinelese started shooting arrows at them, uh, they had to a retreat and find another more safe beach, which they left a few gifts, including a pig, some aluminum, a uh, toy car, some coconuts, things like that. The response from the Sentinelese was rather predictable. They shot arrows, they actually hit the director of the documentary with an arrow, uh, and then they killed the pig, and just buried it on the beach. However, there was one instance of peaceful contact. It happened in 1991, and I'm gonna have to read off the screen to get his name because it's a very complicated name, but he's an anthropologist by the name of Madhumala Chattopadhyay, uh, an Indian anthropologist. Basically, the plan was to offer them gifts of coconuts. They came without weapons and took the coconuts. In a later encounter, they had arrows pointed at them, but a woman showed up and actually pushed the arrow down and stopped them from being attacked. But one thing that came out of this was that they showed they had a very good knowledge of iron. Whenever they saw metal, they seemed to think it was an extremely important thing and they were always trying to take it. And any time a ship uh, runs aground on the barrier reef, even if a crew does survive, uh, they'll come back later and find out that the Sentinelese have stripped a lot of the ship for its iron, usually probably for arrow tips and other pieces of metalwork. Anyways, this anthropological program lasted for a few years. They even tried to do a program where they would plant coconut trees on the island, but by 1994, it was abandoned. Technically, India had a policy that you're not supposed to directly contact these people, and they decided to start enforcing it. Mostly for very logical reasons. If the Sentinelese people considered outsiders safe, that actually could be very dangerous for them. I don't know if you studied history much, but contact between uh, less technologically advanced civilizations and more technologically advanced civilizations uh, tends not to end well for the one on the lower end. Also, after Pandit stopped going to the island, the Sentinelese really broke down in their relationships and they really started to become more hostile towards researchers going to the island. It was gonna be a risk for the people going to the island. The other major story that happened is in 2004, there was a major earthquake in the Indian Ocean that caused a huge tsunami. The Indian government did go to North Sentinel Island to see if everything was okay there. Uh, it looks like that they had survived. They had gone through some pretty tough stuff, but one of the things that happened is that the earthquake caused a good part of that reef to uh, come out of the ocean and add more land to the island, which sounds nice, but that reef was uh, very important for their fishing. It does seem like they've adapted. Now they actually travel several kilometers to the north in order to go fishing. Uh, but yeah, life is a lot harder after the 2004 earthquake. But yeah, since 1994, there's really been very little contact, and intentionally so, any time that it has happened has been illegal. In 2006, a pair of illegal fishermen were fishing off the island. They decided to sleep uh, on their ships, and the anchor that they put down didn't work. So their ship uh, drifted towards the island, and they were both killed. And when the Indian government went to try and get the bodies of those fishermen back, they basically found them impaled on bamboo sticks and uh, decided to just not try it. About three days later, they looked at it with a helicopter, they found the bodies had been buried, and that was when the helicopter got shot at by arrows. So yeah, I guess it was too risky to risk other people's lives to go and retrieve the bodies of these two fishermen, so they didn't bother. So all of that is preamble to get to John Allen Chow. He was a 26 year old American missionary, I believe from Missouri, who was part of a group of missionaries that go to the more dangerous parts of the world for missionary work. There are several countries where missionary work is illegal because you know, coming in and trying to spread your religion and destroy the indigenous culture is not considered kind, especially because in a lot of worlds there are still isolated groups like the Sentinelese that could be very heavily affected by um, Christian missionaries. He traveled to India on a tourist visa and paid some fishermen to get to the island illegally. According to his diary, his plan was that 
he was going to live amongst the Sentinelese and try to spread the word of Jesus to them, which means that him going there was a crime. He was repeatedly warned by the fishermen not to go to the island. He went anyway. Started to sing Christian hymns and Christian songs and try to read Bible verses to them, because you know how well that would work, including the extremely sensitive thing of trying to speak to them in the uh, Shosa language, which is a language indigenous to Southern Africa. But finally, on the 17th of November this year, uh, he went to the island and instructed the fishermen to leave without him. They did. The fishermen later came back and saw the Sentinelese people dragging uh, a dead Chow's body across the beach. And then they came back a bit later and they saw that his body was on the sand. The heavy work of this story has been done by the Washington Post because they got a hold of his uh, his journal. But basically, he felt like he was charged with a divine mission, that this was one of the last holdouts of Satan on Earth and that he needed to go and save them. I think this might be one of the things that people don't appreciate about evangelical Christians, even I don't appreciate about evangelical Christians, is that they are true believers. They do really think that by doing this, they are literally saving people. What they don't understand is that Christianity is specifically imperialist and it's outset. We'll talk about this in a second. But uh, just that they're doing harm and they are making themselves more unwelcome by this kind of work, especially because of things like in this case, where he did not consider that this tribe might have disease immunity or other things that might come with prolonged interaction with people from the outside. And yeah, now that he's dead, uh, the Indian government's not going to charge anybody. They're not going to investigate it. And they gave up on November 28th trying to get his body back. So this brings up a whole lot of really interesting things to chew on. First of all, missionary work is problematic in many ways. I'm sure that I'm preaching to the choir on this one, but why? Well, missionary work, besides the fact that it is uh, very culturally destructive, trying to come to a region and talk to a group of people who have their own culture and their own religion and trying to force them to become Christian through, you know, love bombing them into submission, it is a sign of imperialism. Trust me, missionary work and colonization went hand in hand throughout a lot of European history. And shows that like when I talked about in my video about the concept that like non-Europeans could have visited the Americas and colonized, I think there's something uh, missing in that. A lot of people will speculate with alternate histories about like the Chinese settling the West Coast of the United States, but honestly, Christianity has a fairly unique outlook when it comes to religion, and that is their religion says that they must make converts of all people. It is the fundamental drive of the religion, which has created a culture that allows for expansion, imperialism, and colonization. I'm not saying that's what all Christians believe, but what I'm saying is that being ingrained in the core of Christianity creates a culture, especially when you go into the past and you get into the early modern period, and people did not have the same understanding of Christianity that they do today. I actually think, luckily, a lot of Christians are not evangelicals, and they don't see this part of their religion as important as they used to, which has uh, good connotations. It allows Christianity to modernize and be okay with religious pluralism. But yet, these missionaries still work. They go to countries that are not Christian. They go to countries that are Christian, but are the wrong type of Christian. I found out that a lot of missionaries go to Catholic countries because Catholics, I guess, are the wrong type of Christian. And of course, legendarily, Mormons go anywhere because outside of like Utah, there aren't a ton of Mormons in any other corner of the world. So. They've got a lot of ground to cover. And it also talks about the precarious position of uncontacted tribes. Now, okay, they have been contacted, but because there's no actual language uh, that's been covered, they are very technically uncontacted. They've No one's ever had a conversation with the Sentinelese people. And it's a fascinating thing to unpack and think about. In large parts of South America, especially in Brazil, and also in sort of the Oceania Islands, sort of north of Australia, but south of Asia, have a lot of these groups. And the policies that we have towards them and how we treat them has a lot of ethical discussions about them. Do you deny these people modern medicine? Do you let them live in a hunter-gatherer society that where life is brutish and short? Because we know that 
contact itself has a lot of uh, not so good side effects. And I think that one of the things that we really need to unpack there is how do you do that properly? Or do you do it at all? Is there ever going to be a time where it's a good time to contact an uncontacted tribe? I feel like this will be good fodder for a comment war. So please uh, give me your opinion about if we should do anything at all or what measures we should take to protect them. A lot of the people who live on these islands in the Indian Ocean are also going to be negatively affected by climate change. Uh, the rising oceans are going to make some of their islands much smaller or even disappear. And what do we do in that case? And I think it has interesting implications for more uh, futuristic -y stuff. Like, is this our solution to the Fermi paradox? Is the reason why we haven't met aliens yet because they have a policy very similar to the one that the Indians keep? It very well could be an answer. I don't think it's the answer I believe, but... And if we went to an alien planet and we found an intelligent species but was much less technologically sophisticated than us, what would we do? And how would we do it? And even if we did put laws and protections in place, how many people would intervene anyway? Honestly, I find this whole situation hard to discuss. A young man, a 26-year-old man, is dead. Uh, in the prime of his life. And he died doing something that he believed with all of his heart was the right thing to save unfortunate people. He was wrong, he was brainwashed, but he was a true believer. And the internet seems to be really on board with mocking this guy or making jokes about it, but honestly, it's just sad. I think that interfering with the Sentinelese people uh, poses a lot of risks to them, and I can't condone what happened. This is why I said there's no like right or wrong take here. It's a extremely ambiguous, but very sad set of interactions. I guess the closest people you could blame are the church that indoctrinated him. But in that case, that shows about how dangerous evangelical Christianity can be. And I'm starting to think that a lot of people in the world are pretty aware of that. I honestly wish I had a better answer. Sorry, American Johnson.